So we're being called on a walk-in freezer. If you can hear that sound, it's not frozen up. Sounds like it's running, but the evaporative fan motors aren't coming on. Definitely sounds like we're starving. It's like it was iced up at one point. There's nothing back there. So I walk up on the roof. This is my condensing unit. And it's running. It's running this little hard away. So we're gonna take all the panels off and put some gauges on this guy. Okay. First impression, discharge line's hot. Suction line is like cool, not cold. I don't know if you guys can see that. That sight glass is empty. So what's happening, without even putting my gauges on it, I can already tell you that more than likely we are feeding vapor to that evaporator downstairs. That was the hissing sound. Okay, so this is kind of what I thought it was. So, we've got a headmaster system here. Got some probes on there. Refresher, discharge line coming into the headmaster. Stops and waits for the headmaster to bypass. This is the liquid drain coming out the bottom of the condenser. Refrigerant goes through the head through the condenser when the headmaster is not bypassing. It stops, goes back up, runs through the condenser back and forth, back and forth, turns into a liquid, comes out, liquid drain through the bottom side of the headmaster down into the receiver. That's if it's not bypassing. Now if it's bypassing, discharge gas runs through the condenser, but also goes right here, passes through the headmaster. This valve shuts off. It doesn't let refrigerant, it, it slowly meters it out of this point right here. But it lets the discharge gas bypass straight through into the receiver. And that's exactly what's happening right now. I'll come down here. we can see. So our discharge line temperature is 144 degrees. Our liquid drain is 88 degrees and our liquid line temperature is 130. So notice the liquid drain is lower than the liquid line. So that means that my headmaster is bypassing. But the problem is, look at the sight glass and see if we can catch this. That sight glass is empty. So what's happening, without the winter charge in that receiver, remember, this receiver needs to have a liquid seal in it of winter charge. The extra refrigerant we add to the system so that way we can properly flood the condenser. But right now we don't have that refrigerant. So we are dumping hot vapor right into the receiver and it's running down the other side of the, uh, coming out of the receiver going directly downstairs to the TXV. And that's why we heard that sound inside the evaporator, the hissing sound, is because we're starving that evaporator. We're feeding just pure vapor to that TXV. And that TXV doesn't work with vapor. It has to have 100% liquid. So what we need to do is add refrigerant to this system. We obviously have a leak, but we're gonna add refrigerant and get it operational. I definitely see probably doesn't pick it up as good on the camera but there's oil all over this right here this discharge line but we'll address that later we're gonna get gas in it first and get it off so you hear that sound that evaporator starving it's not dropping the temperature of the evaporator below 20 degrees therefore the evaporative fan motors aren't turning on yeah so we're gonna start adding it now start to see a difference in the sight glass. There's my head pressure coming above 180. 
as it does that, you'll start seeing some action in the headmaster. Slowly metering the refrigerant in. They're just a ball valve. Notice the side glass is getting violent now. Okay. Notice something. It, it didn't take much. I just needed the winter charge, really. The extra refrigerant that needed to be in the system. Let's look at it now. Look at our liquid line temperature, 84. Look at our liquid drain, 83. 190 head pressure. See, I just added the refrigerant until it cleared the sight glass. Now, keep in mind, I'm still gonna have to add a little refrigerant. And let's go over this real quick. Let's step over here. So me as a technician, I have no way of knowing how much refrigerant is in that receiver. The only way I could do this is if I brought my recovery machine up here, recovered all the gas out of it, and then calculated the charge, which is all possible, but it's not practical. So, as a technician walking up on a system that's low in refrigerant, how do I know how much it's missing, and how do I know how much more I need to add? Okay, there is a calculation if you follow the heat crafts uh, headmaster manual, or I should say Sporlin, for the LAC valves. They have a manual that tells you how to calculate it when you're running into this situation where you would essentially add the refrigerant until the sight glass clears, then you're going to calculate the volume that the condenser can hold. But again, that's not a real practical thing for me to do right now because I'm out here servicing this unit. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna fill this system up with the maximum amount of refrigerant I could possibly put in it, okay? That essentially is when that receiver is pumped down, meaning I shut the liquid line coming out of it off and I let the compressor pump all the refrigerant into the condenser and the receiver, I cannot let that receiver fill up more than 80% of the way. So my liquid level should be approximately right here on that receiver. So what you gotta do is take a heat source and this, this can be very dangerous if you don't do this right. You need to take a heat source. Notice I said heat source. Okay, you need to make that decision. You need to take a heat source that can heat up that receiver but that won't exceed the maximum temperature of that receiver which that receiver will have a soft plug on it. If you look at the data plate It'll probably tell you, but I can tell you right now that most receivers, the the melting point of the soft plug is about 430 degrees, 400, somewhere in there. So my heat source that I'm going to use cannot exceed that temperature. And all that you're going to do is pump down the system, and I'll show you once I get ready. We're going to pump down the system, we're going to heat it up, and then we're going to take our finger and run it. And all of a sudden, boom, it'll get red hot right there. That is our liquid level, once I've done it. I haven't done it yet. But once we add refrigerant until we put the maximum amount in there, which is gonna be 80% pumped down, then we fill it up. That's the easiest way and most practical way that I find in the field to do this when we're on the fly. Now, if I have the time, sure. Recover all the refrigerant, calculate the charge, weigh it in. That's, that's the best way, but not always practical. Let's look at our system here. 21 back, 22 back. Get your side glass. Now, it's important to know what my ambient temperature is right now. My ambient temperature is 67 degrees. I'm in Southern California. The coldest that we're gonna get in this particular city, La Habra, California, we gotta to go to the extreme, the absolute coldest day. So typically I say all over Southern California, unless you get into the high desert or the mountain regions, the coldest you're ever gonna get is gonna be 30 degrees, okay? So, I cleared this sight glass at 67 degrees. This, what I'm gonna tell you right now, only applies because I have a headmaster on there, okay? So essentially, I have enough refrigerant for that headmaster to bypass at 60 degrees. I still need to add extra refrigerant, okay? Uh, I'll point out in the manual, 
I'll go to it at the end of this video and show you where when we actually calculate the flooded charge for this, if we did the, the unpractical way, which I told you, it actually looks for the lowest temperature that you could possibly get and you uh, calculate the flooded or the flooded charge at that temperature. And it tells you how much refrigerant you need to add. But again, going back to what I said, the practical way is just to put the maximum amount of refrigerant in there. But you have to be careful because I'm dealing with a small system. This is like a two, three horsepower condensed unit. If I was dealing with a big supermarket system, yeah, we might be dealing with hundreds and hundreds of pounds of refrigerant. I'm dealing with no more than, you know, I'm guessing 18 pounds of refrigerant total charge. And it's not even gonna take that much right now. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, keep charging this guy up. I'm gonna put a little more refrigerant and then we're gonna pump it down and check the liquid level. Well, I'm gonna bring this back here. Notice you don't hear that hissing sound of the evaporator starving anymore because we're now feeding liquid to our TXV. You notice the fans turned on too because the evaporator temperature dropped below 20 degrees. So to pump this system down, I closed the liquid line service valve where I front seated it all the way. Pressure's not shutting off. It's the story of the day. It looks like we got a low pressure control that needs to be adjusted also. There we go. Shut off about negative four. Huh. Okay. So I pumped this down and I'm running my finger up it right now. I've already ran my heat source across it and it gets hot right there at the three quarter mark. You can actually see it with a thermometer too, infrared. So let's go down here. Watch it and then watch where the temperature jump is as I go up. Ninety-five, ninety-six, and let's draw back down. Drops down to about 80 degrees, 79 degrees. So our liquid line is right in there. And you can actually feel it with your hands too. Boom, it just gets hot right there. It's kind of hard to tell. That's my soft plug right there. So your heat source, whatever you use, make sure it doesn't exceed that soft plug. Again, Start at the bottom of the receiver, 70, 75 degrees. Slowly climb. Ninety, so about right there is where we really start to drop temperature. So right in that range. Let's do it again, 78. 80. Notice it gets hotter and hotter and hotter. It's, it's losing temperature too. But yeah, right there. So that's my liquid line. I usually like to uh, mark it too. I'll use like a paint marker. For now, I just got a Sharpie. And I'll put a date on it. So that way the next guy knows that I filled it up on this day. I'm obviously gonna try to find the leak right now too. Whether or not I fix it tonight, I don't know. But we'll at least make sure we got enough refrigerant in there. Here we are running, it's all charged up. We're right about the point where it should start bypassing, right at about 180 head pressure. But it needs to drop below 180 and that's when it starts to bypass. It's also important to know that it's not a full bypass or not bypass. It, it modulates back and forth. So as the pressures drop, it opens a little more. As it raises, it'll close a little more and it, it's just kind of floating. So liquid line temp, 82 degrees, discharge line temp, 122, and liquid drain is on T2, that's 82 degrees. So liquid line temp and liquid drain, let's go right here. Liquid line going into the receiver, liquid drain coming out of the condenser, discharge line, it stops because it's not bypassing and it runs through the condenser like normal and makes liquid refrigerant coming out the liquid drain dumping in to the receiver. There's our liquid level right there. 
maximum amount of refrigerant we can put in that system. Looking good. Now to find the leak. Now it's kind of late today, so I don't know if I'm gonna actually find the leak. I'll do, I'll look at that oil spot real quick, but I'm not gonna go climbing in the attic tonight. It's almost four o'clock, so. I cleaned it up. I leak checked before I took the cap off, couldn't find anything. Used my electronic, couldn't find anything. It's amazing what bubbles can pick up though. So it is in that Schrader. Let's see if I can get this camera to focus here. It's not gonna focus on me, but it's coming out of the Schrader. To focus. Yeah, it won't. But the Schrader's leaking by. So for now, um, very common on these systems, if you guys haven't worked on these, and whenever the discharge line is like basically on the compressor, especially on these pot compressors, these CF12, this is a smaller Copeland, um, the rubber O-rings in that Schrader core are guaranteed are melted inside that thing. Most of the time you can't even get the Schrader core out on these ones right here that it's like right on the compressor. This is a cold zone condensing unit. It's a really common place for them to put a high side port and uh, we always have those Schraders being melted. Most of the time you just gotta permanently seal them off. Put a cap on there, some uh, nylog on the cap and tighten that thing on and you know don't take it off again because most of the time you're not gonna be able to get the Schrader out. What you end up doing is just replacing the whole port, recover all the gas, pop it out, put a new port on there or I'll plug it up and there's plenty of other high side ports. It really doesn't even need to be there. You can get on the liquid line right there. You can get basically on the discharge line at that valve. You know, there's a million other places where we can get high side pressures on this thing. So most of the time that port doesn't even need to be there, but it, I can't get in there with the, the camera cause it's not picking it up. It's not focusing, but it's got micro bubbles popping out of that Schrader. 